great pleasure to uh, be here at the, the Neuro, as I'll call it from now on, in uh, Montreal. Having visited Montreal a number of times over the last 20 years, and uh, having been a good uh, collaborator and friend of David Coleman for uh, many, many years, I'd actually never been into this building before, so it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, I guess, carries on to some extent from what David's spoken about, that it is ways of uh, protecting neurons within the brain. So I want to start off by presenting a, a problem in neuropathology and multiple sclerosis, how we are going about modeling that uh, particular neuropathology, and then how we're using or starting to use biomaterials to try and develop novel therapeutic options for protecting cells um, in MS. So, one of the most important findings in perhaps the last decade, or maybe even the last five years in MS research, has been the realization that although this has been classically called a white matter disease, that um, atrophy of the gray matter, particularly the cortical ribbon and some of the deep gray matter structures, and the accumulation of lesions within that gray matter plays a major role in the progression of clinical deficit. And it's this gray matter atrophy and accumulation of cortical lesions which actually presents the best correlation with the rate of clinical progression, not the accumulation of white matter lesions. <clears throat> you can see clearly here in this very old neurotechnology slide, um, the section of the human brain stained with a myelin protein in brown. And you can see here that the majority of the damage, the pathology, is actually around the outside is where the myelin has been stripped off the gray matter, with very little pathology actually in the white matter itself, some here and here. The majority of the white matter is actually preserved in this particular case. And you can also see that this occurs quite often around the deep sulci within the brain, the deep folds in, in the brain here, here, and up in here. And uh, it's now beginning to be recognized that the immune response that is thought to drive MS, which to begin with is a result of activation of cells in the periphery, an influx of cells into the CNS to drive relapses, that immune response becomes compartmentalized as MS progresses. And just looking at these kind of pictures, you can begin to see that yes, something is happening in these spaces and presumably the subarachnoid space around the brain. So what I want to show you is that some of the data that we generated and ideas, basically, looking at this inflammatory milieu in the CSF that bathes the entire um, human brain. So an observation that we made together with a group in Rome, Francesca Aloisi's group in Rome, was that within these deep folds of the brain, we found accumulations of immune cells, particularly aggregates of CD20 positive B lymphocytes. There are also um, T lymphocytes, both CD4 and CD8 lymphocytes within these large aggregates. And in some of the cases, these aggregates began to take on the form of lymphoid tissues. So they had networks of uh, follicular dendritic cell processes, dividing B cells, and the generation of plasma cells. And this is down into the folds of the brain. We didn't see them at the surface of the the cortical gyri, although that may be a technical issue because that is damaged when brains are taken out post-mortem. And a uh, very quick analysis of both the meninges in these areas and the CSF around here in post-mortem brains shows us, yes, we see pro-inflammatory cytokines raised in these particular cases where we see these structures. TNF expression is increased in these cases, whereas in MS cases without this inflammation that actually um, have a longer disease duration. There's very little increase in TNF. TNF protein concentrations up in the CSF. Interferon gamma expression is up in the meninges, which was what you'd expect for a pro-inflammatory response in the uh, meningeal space. So the idea that this has given us is that really the brain becomes bathed in an inflammatory milieu as MS progresses. This is not an acute thing. This is a slow buildup over time. And there's a gradient. In some cases, this will be more severe than in other cases. In other cases, it might be quite mild. And the extent of this inflammation correlates very well with the rate of disease progression. So the more inflammation MS progresses more rapidly. 
So what are the consequences of this kind of slow build-up of inflammation around the outside of the brain and also to some extent around the perivascular spaces within white and grey matter? Can we model it and can we turn it to our advantage for therapeutic purposes? And I'll deal with that last question towards the end. So it's given us some ideas about protecting the brain. Now, obviously, there's some very valuable cells in the grey matter of the cortical ribbon. All the most important cells of the human brain, perhaps, the cortical neurons lie underneath the subarachnoid space here. It's not my picture, it's just a very pretty one that I like. Um, some of the pyramidal neurons lie quite close to that subarachnoid space, some much deeper, and one be and therefore, if this is bathed in an inflammatory milieu and there's very little barrier here, there are going to be consequences to that. So, a number of years ago, a PhD student looked at the, the cellular pathology and all the different cell types under these areas and made the remarkable discovery that, that over 50% loss of large neurons in some rapidly progressing MS cases. So there's a lot of neuronal loss in MS. People hadn't looked at it before because they were fixated on the white matter generally. Um, that loss can be greater than that which is seen in Alzheimer's patients. But this is occurring in people who are dying often before the age of 40 or 50. So it's occurring earlier on perhaps than it is in the other neurodegenerative conditions. So the hypothesis would be that these accumulations of inflammatory cells, a mixture of B cells, T cells, monocytes, uh, are producing some sort of inflammatory soup up here that we've also shown that it causes breaches in this very thin <coughs> layer made up of squamous epithelial cells and astrocyte end feet, the glial limitans, and there are breaches of this so that the cytokines can actually diffuse directly in and have direct effects in these upper layers and presumably indirect effects in these lower layers because neurons are lost down in the lower layers as well. We don't yet know the nature of those molecules, but I should say that a, a collaboration between um, Amit Baharol's group here at the um, MNI and my own in London, um, and a student is set to come across to London in the next um, month or two to actually uh, use some of their, your technology to um, analyze the molecular signals in some of these cells, particularly the B lymphocytes that are up here to see what they may be producing that may be toxic to the various cell types underneath the glial limitans. There's a whole host of possible molecules that might be important here. But this also got us thinking. These cells are acting as biological pumps. They're causing pathology, but can that be turned to one's advantage to actually deliver um, therapeutic molecules in some way? It's an interesting space, as you can see here from this scanning electron micrograph. Quite a large fluid-filled space with all these trabeculae looking like a, a dark forest from Lord of the Rings. And uh, that space is remarkably, um, well, there is a barrier here between the, the um, perivascular space and the subarachnoid space, but it's broken in lots of places. It's fenestrated. There are windows that allow the molecules in here to also um, move down the perivascular space and presumably in reverse as well. So first we set about modeling this because you can't do much more than create hypotheses with postmortem human tissue, so you need to model this. It's very difficult to do because um, most of the animal kingdom doesn't have the folded brain structure that we have, therefore there aren't sulci. Um, and we haven't yet set up the ability to work on, on some of the larger mammals. In the rat, there's one sulcus, which is the midline, down here between the two hemispheres. So what we said about is, can we reproduce that pathology in the rat? So uh, using neurosurgery, we actually uh, inject, it's, the space is much bigger than in this diagram, we inject um, pro-inflammatory cytokines down into this space, and at the moment we're using TNF and interferon gamma, we're also looking at lymphotoxin alpha. And if you do this in animals that have just had um, an injection of adjuvant, incomplete Freund's adjuvant, then you get activation of the microglia, you get a, a meningeal inflammation, there are some inflammatory cells down here, 
The microglia begin to look a bit more activated. They're woken up. These are not the same as very resting cells. Note here also that myelin in the grey matter and the rat goes right up to the edge. There's plenty of myelin at the edge of the cortex here, as there is in the human brain in actual fact. If we then do this in animals that have been immunized with a myelin protein, so they have circulating activated B cells against a myelin protein from the CNS, we then cause this demyelination around the end, around the edge of the cortical gray matter that looks remarkably like that seen in MS, again here. The microglia are now very angry looking, and we think are actively involved in stripping off the myelin here but it's not involving classical macrophages in this particular model. So this is, it's a B-cell dependent event. We actually think it's not necessarily antibody dependent, so it's probably involving B-cell cytokines as a result of the activation of B-cells with this particular myelin protein. But we've got more to do on that mechanism. But the student who's coming over will be looking at what possible molecules, um, B-cell and b cell subtypes are making that may be able to induce this type of pathology. And in this particular model, you also see similar um, meningeal inflammation to that seen in MS, groups of inflammatory cells sitting up here in the perivascular space, the glia limitans is here, CD8 positive cells and monocytes within this space, activated microglia underneath, but there doesn't seem to be much crossing of cells into the brain, and also macrophages here, so ED1 positive over the surface of the brain, but the microglia underneath are not really amoeboid, they're still kind of activated, but not turning into large rounded macrophages. So there's a bit of separation in terms of cell types between these two compartments. But this is an acute model, it occurs over um, about seven days and then is repaired by seven days later. So we now turn to ways in which we can create a chronic model to really model what we see in MS. The first approach we've taken is to use lentiviral vectors. This is a VSVG, uh, CMV promoter-driven GFP lentiviral um, vector. We've injected it into the same subarachnoid space. We found that within one week, we can transduce most of the cells over the surface of the cortex here. And this is a combination of astrocytes, the astrocyte end feet, but also, and as you can clearly see here, expressing GFAP, an astrocyte protein. Here with a confocal microscope, you can see this astrocyte with its end foot being transduced by the lentiviral vector. But also most of the epithelial cells have been transduced as well. So that's one approach. The other approach that we've been looking at is using biotechnology, uh, sorry, uh, biomaterials basis, that is nanoshells um, which can be engineered to express various molecules. We can inject them down into this space. They stay in this space for long periods of time. They actually, they cluster, which is probably not a good idea. You don't want to completely block this space and therefore block CSF flow with time. So we need to work on how to um, space them out a bit. There is macrophage activity, but they're actually not removed. They're biocompatible, but there's macrophage activity. They're not destroyed. So we're moving on from that to try and think of ways in which we can use that technology to actually create a system where we're filling up this space with biological pumps like the cells that we see in MS, but in a way that this space does not become blocked. Uh, the CSF flow continues. So using collagen hydrogels, you can create this kind of network of collagen fibrils that you can put in there, but flow is still allowed through that space. And we're now doing that with the lentiviral vectors to begin with in this particular case. It slows down transduction, but transduction still occurs. And the end thing we want to do, last slide, Stefano, this might seem like a, a long stretch from what we've been doing, but this type of approach is being used increasingly in other conditions, not CNS, and as usual, the brain is perhaps the last frontier for this kind of approach. That we are using um, biocompatible polymers attached to our DNA plasmids, or siRNA in this case for a TNF receptor, bind them, the polymers are um, 
cross into the cells, they're good at transducing the cells. If you put this inside microspheres, also around the edge, and then tether those microspheres to the collagen hydrogel using um, various linkages that can either be cleaved by enzymes there or antibody targeted to the, the hydrogel, you can create this system of collagen fibrils with your plasmids that can then transduce the cells around, or in this case, the cells underneath. So although this might seem like fiction at the moment, um, we've uh, developed uh, an EU consortium that is preparing to use, uh, test this kind of approach to produce an epicortical delivery system for delivering both cytotoxic to create models and also um, therapeutic molecules such as anti-inflammatory cytokines, uh, neurotrophic factors to protect neurons underneath the subarachnoid space in models to begin with of MS and uh, Alzheimer's disease. And this work's been done in collaboration with a group in, in Galway and Ireland who are producing the biomaterials and we're doing all the in vivo testing work of this approach. So though there's a lot to be done before that this could be anywhere near the clinic, um, and we don't know much yet about the toxicity of these uh, particles to the brain and the subarachnoid space. Um, it does represent a new approach to therapeutics that could be applicable to a number of different neurodegenerative conditions, not just uh, MS and Alzheimer's. So I thank you. <laughs>